Hello and welcome to Impact, the programme where we take a look at issues and topics that are impacting our lives and also take a look at how we can impact others with the gospel. And tonight we are going to be talking about how to be a Christian on campus. And this is for you uni students out there who are at uni currently or those who are thinking about going to university. How can we hold on to our faith during our time of study and all the distractions? and challenges that come can come with university because university can be daunting. It's a time of change, development, growth and is a key formative and decision making period. Being a Christian on campus can also be challenging, but there is an organisation called Fusion who supports students in these areas. Their aim is to equip inspire and prepare students for a life of mission and discipleship at university. And on today's impact, we have Will Revel, who is a student missions developer at Fusion. Will, welcome to Impact. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. I think we're going to get such an insightful look at the work you do with young people, those who are currently at uni and all the student link ups and church link ups you do, but also hearing your personal testimony as well, which I'm sure will really empower and inspire others as well. So welcome to Impact. And what I like to do um, for our guests on Impact is really rewind and go back to basics and start from the bottom and get to understand and know you a little bit better. So Will, do tell us about yourself. Where were you born? what was life like growing up and what was your family life like yeah thanks um yeah i guess a good place to start is that um i was born and raised in a christian home in north london um, my dad worked as a broker in the heart of the city of london at one of the world's leading insurance markets called lloyd's it's quite a tr traditional uh, place uh, my mum worked as a pa before going into full-time parenting um You've guessed right. Uh, my mum definitely had the harder job out of me, out of my mum and my dad. Uh, raising two boys um, uh, took real strength and wisdom. I um, was grateful for her bountiful time and resources. And she was incredibly supportive uh, in our schooling and in our interests outside of school. My dad was a huge uh, cricket fan. I used to go to um, the local cricket club to watch him play when I was younger. Uh, he loved a decent walk with our Labrador, Alfie. Um, he was very gentle in character. Um, he was quite modest, quite playful, uh, non-assuming, um, a non-anxious presence. And he was incredibly devoted to our family. Um, so life was really secure, uh, was really um, opportunist, um, opportunistic. Um, and I guess uh, I loved um, sport as well. I, I'm a big Arsenal fan. Um, I played football for my local football team um, throughout my young younger years, probably from the age of seven right up to the age of 18. Um, we trained twice a week and played matches on the weekend. And uh, I guess for me, at the age of 13, um, football was a, was a big part of my life. And um, it created a, a big dilemma when it came to like faith and church for me. Um, football at the age of 13 was going to switch from a Saturday from where I used to play to a Sunday, which meant rather than going to like the church youth groups on a Sunday morning, I was going to be playing football instead. And therefore, I had a choice whether to go along to church at all or make that jump to the evening service where um, probably my age group would start to develop their faith. And although I wouldn't describe the church that I grew up in as overly charismatic, um, I knew that the evening service was definitely a place where I started to sense and long for more of God's presence in my life. I knew God was real. I, I, I knew that he loved me. His fingerprints were all over my life. And I think it was this truth and assurance um, that helped me lean on my faith um, throughout my school life, um, particularly growing up in the North London multicultural secondary school. You're going to get people who are, who are of very different backgrounds of values and beliefs and opinions. And they certainly weren't afraid to hurt those opinions at you. And I think being able to make a decision um, during that uh, age of 13 to go to church in the evening to really discover and see what life could look like with God in my life was a huge um, was a huge thing for me. And mm. I guess um, 
yeah, sorry, go for it. No, I was just going to say, amazing. I think it's so right how at the mm. age of 13 you made such a mature decision. I guess a lot of the guys at your age would have been choosing football over going to church and having their passion and their heart within their sport rather than their hunger for God. So I think that's really incredible how you made that decision to choose God over your passion. And I'm sure he has blessed you in that. And you had that stability growing up because you had that personal relationship with God. And you mentioned you grew up in a Christian family. What was your personal mm. relationship with God like? How did you find out more about him? Was your parents both Christians when they grew up? How did you get that connection with God? Yeah, interesting. Um, so my mum and dad actually met at the church uh, that I grew up in. So they met in their 20s. Uh, they married and then they had us as, as kids. And I grew up in the same church in the youth groups up until the age of 18. Um, I guess where I was where at the point of my life where I experienced God in all its in all his fullness was probably at the age of 16. I was sent to a youth um, summer festival um, where thousands of youth would gather. And during one of the main sessions, there was a ministering of the Holy Spirit. And like I said before, I, I, I went to a quite conservative church back at home in North London. And um, although the Holy Spirit was talked about, you know, the Holy Spirit was there to help um, us interpret scripture, uh, to live out scripture. I hadn't seen um, the, uh, the spirit in all its fullness. And I was there at that summer festival, um, seeing the ministering of the Holy Spirit, people uh, being healed and saved um, because of the presence of God. And one uh, part of that session, we were encouraged to pray with um, other people in that venue space, in that arena. And for me, I was drawn to a group that were gathering around this guy who was partially physically impaired. And um, he was using a wheelchair at the time and um, after a long while of prayer, the guy who, who was experiencing long-term difficulties and pain uh, stood up without any pain for the first time in mm. years. And a few days later, I then saw the same guy again uh, at a different venue space. This time it was karaoke. He was dancing. <laughs> he, was, uh, he had no pain in his body. And for me, witnessing healing of this time, witnessing the Holy Spirit in all of its fullness was a total revelation for me. Um, I guess, you know, you, you asked me, what was my faith like growing up? I guess up until that point, my faith was probably unknowingly limited. It was probably a bit contained. Um, it was only to help me get through my life. I talked about school and now God was alive. He was wanting to be made known beyond the walls of myself. He was powerful. And I guess for me, I head back um, after, after that summer festival to do my A-levels uh, between the ages of 17 and 18 at the same school, but yet it was sick form this time in the same site. And um, a teacher approached me a few uh, weeks into term and asked me where I wanted to lead a Christian gathering of fellow students at the school. And I just remember thinking, you had no idea that I'm a Christian. And secondly, God, I, I feel like you're saying to me, I'm not going to let you unsee what you've seen. Um, I've got plans for you. I want you to be bold. I want you to build up my body and tell people about me. And um, I'm going to be with you in that in that period of your A-levels. So, um, yeah, I'd say unknowingly limited at the time before really like experiencing God um, and witnessing um, like the power and the ministering of the Holy Spirit at the age of 16 um, was where I was at. Incredible. I love them kind of events. I used to go to them growing up as a Christian in my household as well of, of the festivals and the camps and the Christian events for young people. I think they're so amazing to really be able to see the power of God and see the Holy Spirit working. So thank you for sharing that where your faith really de developed and had that personal relationship with God. And you mentioned there your A-levels. God got you through your A-levels. And tonight we are talking about university. So of course, from your A-levels, you went on to university. So do tell us what university did you go to and what did you study? Yeah, uh, so I went to the University of Southampton. This was back in 2015. It was a three-year course and I studied geography uh, up until 2018. The classic line is always, did you do colouring in whilst you were, <laughs> you were there at university? And I can put the rumours to bed. I did not do any colouring in. It was a lot more research, a lot more practical stuff, uh, but it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the human side of geography, the more economic side of geography rather than the physical side, which is more environmental and scientific. Um, but yeah, it, I had a really good time of just learning more about the world, learning more about uh, society and culture and how it all works together. And I think that's probably helped me in my job today, working with university students, working in culture, working in society uh, and what and what their roles are in different spheres. 
Definitely. And when you went to university and you decided you wanted to do geography, what was your aims and ambitions? What were your goals that you wanted to achieve once you'd left university? Why did you choose geography? Oh, um, to be honest, it was the best subject that I got the best result in oh, at, university, at, at school. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after university, but I certainly knew that geography was the foundation um, for a lot of different things. You know, geography is um, taps into the economics, it taps into the science, it taps into the uh, sociology, the political um, realms of, of, of society. And so I thought, surely I'm going to pick up something whilst doing geography that might grab my appetite um, to work on um, uh, beyond university. I think aside from my studies, I, I was there because I wanted to explore uh, new opportunities and new adventures outside the family home. You know, we're sheltered up into the age of 18 uh, when we're uh, out growing up in uh, wh wherever you are, whether it's with a guardian or whether it's with parents or a single parent um, household. And we learn things through our parents that maybe aren't true. We learn things uh, or habits that we may want to change or we learn things about ourselves that um, that may not be that may not be true as well. And so I wanted to have a goal of just exploring more of who I was. I wanted to rub alongside brothers and sisters in Christ that I could get to know. Um, we talked about earlier about how hard it can be growing up uh, between the age of 13 and 18 um, as a youth in church. Uh, not many people actually end up graduating uh, youth group um, by the end of um, your time of A-levels. And so for me, I was looking for brothers and sisters in Christ that I could really grow with um, and really um, like do life with uh, alongside Jesus. Um, and so those were probably the, the main things, adventure, opportunity, um, understanding more of who I was and um, getting to know people that would actually end up being friends of mine till this very day, which I'm very blessed to have. Amazing. And I think that's the exciting thing about university, isn't it? It's not just the studying, but it's it's the eye-opening experience of it. You get to learn, like you say, a lot more about other cultures, about yourself. There's so much personal development and that can also bring your relationship closer to God. And I wonder if you could give some advice, if there's someone watching now, they're thinking, they may be doing their A-levels at the moment, they're thinking about mm. uni in the future. What kind of advice would you give them in making a decision? Because I think sometimes people can feel pressured into going to university, whether that be from their friends, whether that their family, mm. maybe the school is saying, oh, university is the best option for you. And university, yes, is a great experience and you can learn a lot from that, but it's not necessarily for everyone. So what advice can you give someone if they're not sure whether to go to university or not? Yeah, it's a really good um, thought. I think what I'd say is weigh up where the opportunity is at home in contrast to what you're wanting to do at university. You know, there's plenty of apprenticeships out there. There's plenty of entrepreneurial opportunities that you can easily get stuck into um, at home. Um, although it's uh, lovely to go away and experience life in a different way, it does put you £27,000 in debt and plus. Um, and so um, financially, it is a, it is a big uh, investment to go to university. But I think I think I'd just say, um, you know, work out what you're passionate about does it have to be at university or is it before your very eyes and do you just need to pray and figure out what that might be it might be chatting to people at church it might be chatting with friends asking them what they're going to be going to do after university it might be sitting down with parents and going or guardians and going what 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 really is for me like is this going to be something that um that is going to benefit me or is this something that is going to be okay but may hinder me um, the people around you in your close proximity are the best people that know you. So ask them the questions as much as reflecting yourself. Definitely. Really good advice there. And I think the main point is, like you say, pray. God knows you better than anybody. And I love the verse. My favorite verse is Jeremiah 29, 11, that says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the mm. Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you mm. hope and a future. And if you're struggling today and you don't know what your future holds, then ask God because he sees outside of time. He sees your life from beginning to end and he knows what's best for you. So if you are struggling, just ask him for confirmation. And like Will said, the people around you um, and maybe your church family ask them and just pray about it and see what God puts on your heart and, and like Will said your passions and desires are so important and I think personally if you're in a job or whatever it is you're studying I think you really need to enjoy it and love what you're doing otherwise mm -hmm. if you're there dreading it every day you're just kind of wasting your time and life can be short and we need to be happy in what we're doing and that's not always 
the, the case. It's not always that great opportunity. You're going to get your dream job straight away. Um, but God has a plan for you and he wants to give you what's best for you. So yeah, definitely just pray to him and ask him to guide you in this decision and give you the wisdom that you need to make the decision. But will university can be full of life changing uh, events that happen within university campus, new lifestyles, different things going on. But within your personal testimony, sadly, something quite major happened in your first year of uni, didn't it? Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I think by the time I arrived at university, I couldn't wait for the next chapter to begin. You know, although there were plenty of questions and unknowns ahead, I felt that the, the academic graph, the personal growth, the spiritual preparation had set me up. Uh, well to experience new adventures outside the family home. Like I said, to grow alongside brothers and sisters in Christ, to witness to people in my university context. And all of these inklings before university became a reality. I had such a wonderful time in the first month of Freshers' Week and Freshers' Month. Um, but um, the trajectory kind of took a bit of a dip when I received news that um, my dad, um, who I'd left uh, to go to university, had been admitted to hospital. And a few months before, I remember um, there being signs of shortness of breath uh, on holiday when we were in Italy. And although it could be normal to feel fatigued walking around a super humid country, uh, he was struggling to keep up with me and my brother, particularly when we were climbing um, Mount Vesuvius of all places. Um, but this was so unlike our dad, a man who exercised um, at 5 a.m., took the dog for a walk before doing a 12-hour working day, commuting in and out of central London. He most definitely put us to shame at times, us youngsters. And I just remember this condition continued um, up until the September. I went to university in the October and I remember being at home and him coming down the stairs in the morning. And um, he just, uh, before he went to work and he just said to me, I was like, well, I've got, I don't know what's going on, but I've got this chesty cough um, and I, I, I've had it for a while now and I can't seem to shake it off. And eventually we put the conversation to bed because we thought it was seasonal. We thought it was something that would shift and there wasn't point in worrying too much. Um, but of course, um, he didn't really shake it off. And by November of my first semester in my first year, my dad was diagnosed with um, a condition called mesothelioma. Now, mesothelioma is like a type of cancer that mainly develops in and affects the lining of, of the lungs. Um, and although, it, although it, can be, it can affect the lining of other vital organs. And um, the way mesothelioma really comes about is that it's almost always caused by exposure to asbestos, which uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, asbestos is basically a group of minerals that are made up of microscopic fibers um, that were used in the 1970s and the 1990s um, to construct buildings. Uh, and research discovered that these fibres could easily get into the lungs, it could get stuck, but it would usually take about 20 years or more after the initial exposure for there to be any significant problem. Um, it's very rare, it's 2,700 people are diagnosed with mesothelioma each year in the UK, most of which are 75 or over. Um, my dad was 60 at the time when he was diagnosed with mesothelioma. Uh, and he would never worked on a construction site in his life. Like I said, he was a broker in the city of London. Um, he never did any sort of hard labor. Um, and as soon as we found out about this um, diagnosis, uh, we actually found out that there was no cure to it either. And within the space of four weeks of me learning the news that he'd been diagnosed with it, he died um, in London. And um, that was quite a different turn to the path that I thought I was going to be on at university. Um, for any 18-year-old adapting and thriving in a new city, um, doing academic studies, doing uh, living life to the full, it was going to be complicated, but I didn't think it was going to be this complicated. Um, and for me, I had to soon sort of comprehend pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be doing university life um, fatherless. I was going to be doing it for the rest of my life. Um, which is a pretty scary place to be. It's quite numbing. Uh, it's quite shocking. Uh, you feel angry. You feel really sad. You feel depressed. Uh, you bargain. You go, what could I have done to have saved him? What could I have done differently? You know, what could I have... Um, could I have had more conversations? Could I have loved him better? You know, all these things that grief really, really presents to us. And like... like you know, grief gives us no warning. Um, it's, it comes in a multitude of waves. And for me, 
on top of the highs and the roller coasters and uh, of university life, grief was going to be an added complexity to my journey, really. Thank you for sharing that, Will. I can't imagine how difficult that must have been to, to receive that news. Like you say, you're living away from your family and, and all these questions start coming in throughout your grief. And I wonder, how did your relationship with God, did it develop through this time of grief? Did you ever blame God mm. at any point? Was you angry at him for perhaps taking your, your father away? How was your relationship with God in that moment of time? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I think it, I think I can think of two things that, I, that really stood out to me about my processing and it's going to take a bit of a turn but we're going to come back to Jesus in a bit um I remember sitting in my in my bedroom watching uh, a Richard Curtis film of all of all things called About Time um I don't know whether you've seen it but it's a it's a film um about um uh, it's basically a nice rom British rom-com film and uh, the main character Tim uh, he discovers in the film that he has an awesome ability to time travel he does all sorts of things with time travel in an attempt to change things of the past in the hope of improving the future. And he does many different things throughout the film. He saves his friend's play from going wrong. Uh, he turns his fortunes around with the ladies. He gets himself a girlfriend. And he, he also prevents his sister from being in a fatal car crash. But as the film drew to an end whilst I was watching it, like me, Tim also discovers that his father had terminal cancer. And in that time, um, Tim's ability to time travel couldn't fix the ultimate impending reality. And before um, Tim's father dies, the main character, um, his dad gives him a piece of advice um, to help him through death and to help him through life. And he tells him in order to truly live happily, he should try and live each day twice. The first time round, he advises Tim to embrace the everyday tensions of life, the worries, the pressures, the lows. Life would inevitably throw at him, really. And, but then the second time round, he advises Tim to acknowledge and experience just how world, just how sweet the world could truly be. And I sat in my bedroom going, if only it was that simple. If only I could time travel to control exactly how, when to be happy and, and when to be sad. And like I said, grief is complicated. But yet when I looked at the Bible, of strength i soon didn't feel totally alone in the complexity and the ambiguity of what i was facing um, and i guess my relationship developed with god in a sense of peace because I, I started reading scripture that really spoke to me in my time of grief i remember reading saint paul said i don't want you to grieve like the rest of humanity does without any hope rather he says those who know and confess faith in jesus can and must grieve both profoundly and fully and yet do so with hope and then i remember reading again um the, the story of jesus at the tomb of lazarus during my university years and i remember reading about how how jesus was what his body language was like uh, jesus when he came to mary and martha he didn't really say uh there there you know stiff up a lip you know uh, be strong carry on you'll be fine. Instead, he, he, he weeps. And Jesus, who was the son of God, he, he knew that, that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he still wept because he knew that this wasn't part of God's original design for the world. Like death was not part of the plan. Pain and suffering was not part of that plan. And Jesus knew the only way that he could get Lazarus out of the tomb was if he put himself in it. If Jesus was to guarantee resurrection for all who believed in him, he had to go to the cross. And that's what he did. And I guess because of Jesus's death, I felt released from all the feelings of grief and death um, because I share in his resurrection. And that was my hope when I was in my student bedroom, you know, reading scripture. That was my hope. I didn't need to time travel. I didn't need to separate the day into two. I didn't need to stifle grief or give away to despair because I was able to put hope and add it to my pain and suffering even when I was on campus, even when I was doing everyday life in Southampton. And when I postured myself in this hope, I, I didn't just hope aimlessly. Instead, I knew my hope was personal. I knew that Jesus put himself in the grave of my dad so he would have eternal life. 
and he would be reunited with me one day if I continued to confess faith in Jesus. So I, I knew my hope was also material because Christianity promises not only a spirit only future, but a renewed heaven and earth with new bodies. So I knew that was that was great news. And I knew my hope was beatific, like the idea that I was I was going to be with the Lord Jesus again. But you know, you, you, you asked me what, what life was like, although I knew all of this. Drinking was also part of my university experience because alcohol was cheap. It was also readily available. I also turned to unhealthy relationships as well because I wanted to fill that void in my life that I lost. And despite going through all the motions where I questioned my faith in God, there was also that last bit of hope as well, which was about assurance. I knew that even though I made mistakes and took God for granted at times, I was not only confident about the future world of love that Jesus promised, the vision of God, the renewed universe, but I was assured that this was astoundingly mine to claim. You know, in Romans, it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And yes, I went off and did my own thing at times. I confessed faith in Jesus. I knew the hope was material, personal, beatific and assured. But I still did, you know, turn the other way. And but I, I, knew I just want to pick up on that yeah. just because I think, of course, through grief, often people can turn to something else to mm. fulfill them. They can turn to, like you say, drinking or, or drugs or a, a different way of life because they mm. want to escape the pain and they don't want to feel what they're feeling. So they, they take something else to take that away. Or even just general students on a university campus face these temptations, face these distractions, mm. because like you say, uni lifestyle is all about drinking, partying, going out, having fun. So if someone's watching today and maybe they are at mm. university, maybe they have tried these different avenues, whether it's for a, a loss or they've lost someone or whether it's just because they're trying to fit in or whatever the case is, if people feel like they've been convicted right now that they think, hang mm. on a minute, this is me. I've, I've gone down a path that I know I shouldn't be going down, but I feel like I want my identity, I want friends, I want to be like, I want to be accepted, or I'm trying to run away mm. from this feeling. What advice can you give those people that God isn't angry at them, God loves them, and he's got his arms wide open, and he wants them to come back to them? How can we encourage them to come back to God and come back to the word? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think um, Jesus knows us. He sees us and he loves us, no matter what we do. And there is grace in in the cross there is mercy in the cross and um like jesus wept with me in my grief like jesus might like like weep with you in your addiction your loneliness your struggle your temptations like he he's still there for you he still has his arms wide open and you know i'm just reminded of the prodigal son like the father he doesn't care about his status. He, he flings his, wire, his arms wide open. He runs towards his son who's gone off and done his own thing, um, who's done the lifestyle that probably the university life is, but he has his arms wide open. And he, he, Jesus suffered profoundly and fully, yet he did it so that we could have hope um, beyond uh, the mistakes that we make. Um, and I, yeah, I just encourage you, um, don't do it alone, find friends, uh, find people that you can trust, that you can be accountable to. The local church is an amazing place where you can find home and that same hope that I found in my university bedroom in Jesus. Um, so have a look at, um, local churches that are around because they will want to embrace you. They will want to love you, disciple you and empower you to share your uh, faith um, and testimony like I am doing today. So I'd say do that. Definitely amazing. And I love that the prodigal son is just a, such a beautiful example, isn't it? That no matter how far we run away, God is always there with his arms open wide from when we are ready to come back. So thank you for sharing that. Now, Will, as I mentioned, you work for an organisation called Fusion. And on their website, you have a little bio page. And on there, I noticed there was some statistics, university statistics um, mm. in relation to students. And it says that 99.22% of UK students 
don't yet know the extravagant love of Jesus, meaning that 99.22% are unaware of the spiritual life jacket local churches provide that intercepts sinking, let alone growth opportunities that enable students to swim with belief. And also that 73% of students abandon their faith during these years. Firstly, whereabouts mm. did you get these statistics from and what do you make of these? They are quite sad statistics, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think the statistics were taken from a survey that we did a number of years ago. Um, and yeah, you're, you're totally right. It is, a, um, it is a devastating statistic that there's less than 1% of students going to church in the UK, uh, which that means that there's 99% of students that you'll walk past in your university city that don't know the gospel. Um, and, um, you know, we as, we as Fusion want to provide um, an opportunity to resource churches to prepare their young people well for university. We have a load of training and resources that do that, uh, that go through um, the opportunities, the culture, um, the legacy, the identity that you want to leave at university if you're heading to university in September this year. Um, but we also have a number of different ways in which we work with local churches. We're connected to over two and a half thousand churches on our student link up page. Um, we realistically work with about four to five hundred churches who probably have student workers in their church who are readily available to pastor students. And um, we want to help them uh, be visible in their community. So we're always constantly working and challenging uh, these churches to be out on campus, to be out in their communities, knocking on student doors and um, offering um, services and um, offering opportunities to be discipled and just to be cared for. You know, um, we are currently doing another survey at the moment. We've done about a thousand. We've had about a thousand responses at the moment, and we're hoping to get about 2000 by the end of spring. And one of the questions in which we ask students uh, on campus is this. If a friend invites you to, you to church, what would you say? Would you say yes or would you say no? And we are astounded to, to, to know that at the moment, about 75%, about seven in 10 students would say yes to going to church if a friend invites them. Yet there's still 1% of students plugged into local churches. And I think there's a number of different reasons as to why that is the case. I think um, we need to be, um, we need to be uh, more bold with, uh, with, with being out and being visible in our communities as churches. I think um, also young people are biblically illiterate. They uh, aren't reading their Bible as much. And it means that actually when they're tested, when they're asked about faith, they don't have a lot of answers to give. And so what we're trying to do as Fusion is trying to, trying to help churches disciple their students well uh, through the context of small groups and other different sources of training. Um, and I think, I think if we're able to install confidence into the local church to do all these things, then I think we will see that 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 number shift um, in in years to come, which I'm hopeful for, and I know um, a lot of my colleagues are too. Definitely, I think it's amazing the work that you guys do at Fusion because I think having that Christian to support at university is so important. Oh, I know when I was at university, I was part of a Christian union, so we'd meet on a, a weekly basis and we'd be able to share the scriptures together and encourage each other, and to also have a church during your university time, and especially if you're able to link up churches with a big youth group. Because I think sometimes when we're growing up and we we go to church and there's no one our age there, it can be quite disengaging and quite disconnecting. So I think it's great the work that you guys are doing to really support uni students and especially no matter what it is they're going through they need that support and need each other um, to lean on so I think that's incredible and we've seen revivals take place at university for example in America in Absbury the, the revival that has been over two weeks I think and I think oh, it was estimated over 20,000 people attended that they actually had to move to another location so we are going to go to this CBN clip that's giving us an insight of what happened at Asbury University. University. God has been moving among the students and faculty and people are traveling to the university to join in this move of God. Well, one student told CBN News he prays this revival when, will encourage churches and pastors and stir up a hunger for the Lord. Wendy Griffith brings us the story from Wilmore, Kentucky. As hundreds of people have come from near and far to just enjoy the presence of God, even though it's almost midnight, this auditorium is still packed with people that are still coming in. In the last two evenings, 
since we've estimated well over 3,000 people that are here and at these different locations uh, to worship the Lord. Were you prepared for this? No, there is no, there's no playbook for this. And we're still trying to create some space for what's happening here. And so that's a delicate balance and we're trying to manage that as thoughtfully and faithfully as we can and just steward what's happening on campus. skeptical at first just because growing up with my church we never had anything like this and so I just wasn't used to the idea of a revival um, but the longer it's gone on I've realized that if God wants it to happen it's gonna happen my prayer is that this will encourage churches encourage pastors encourage this believers um, and just stir up a hunger for the Lord because again it's not it's not about Asbury it's about Jesus God is always all around us. He is always waiting for us. We keep asking him, when are you going to pour yourself out over us? And he keeps saying, well, when are you going to receive it? When are you going to take the time to come and just sit at my feet and let me pour into you? You can have revival every day. You can have Jesus 24 hours a day. It all depends on, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? If you are, if you seek him first, then you'll find him. Amen. And it is incredible to see what is happening at Asbury University. But I do also want to remind you that God is everywhere. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And wherever you are, whether you're at home, whether you're at university, at a church, God is with you and Jesus is guiding you. And you just need to call out to him and ask him to be in your life and be evident in your life. But Will, it is incredible to see when these revivals take place, so many young people really connecting with God and feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit. What do you make of revival? like this? I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? We're seeing a Gen Z uh, generation leading other Gen Zers to Christ. Uh, it's just phenomenal. Yet, it's also nothing new, right? Uh, it sounds very familiar to what we do in our faith every day. We pray, we worship, uh, we all have testimonies to share like students are sharing with um, uh, college students across that campus in Asbury. Um, I love it because there's no production. There's no flashing lights. You could see there's no smoke machines that, um, that, that, that students are being attracted to. It's, it's utterly on Jesus. And I think um, students there are doing a wonderful job in guarding and stewarding that space against any hype. You know, we're seeing a communal hunger and it always starts with consistent confession, these kind of awakenings. Uh, and then there's a hunger to seek God in prayer and worship. And we're also seeing, particularly in Asbury, there's people with distinct and unique diversities. They're drawing the unchurched who recognize their tongues. And we read similar in Acts 2, where the spirit of Pentecost comes. You remember that story where the unchurched um, are flogging to the place where they're hearing and they're seeing crowds form. And it's because they're hearing every single tongue. They're hearing their own language being spoken. And I think that's what God is doing. He's using, um, you know, uh, groups like the ones in Asbury to like uh, to really um, unify the church and to really um, bring in a, a whole variety of people to experience his presence. And somebody working at Fusion, I'm just so excited because this uh, this Asbury awakening it's raising the profile of students. Students are the ones who are leading the way for the rest of the church to get hungry for God. And I think when we think about revivals, I think I think I, I listened to something that Pete Gregg said um, the uh, recently, and he he said that awakenings happen um, are very similar to how viruses spread. And there's two ways in which viruses spread and need to need to have in order for it to be big. Firstly, there has to be an intensity in the initial infection. And secondly, there needs to be networks that are well connected in order for it to travel. And the history of revival backs this up. There's never been a widespread awakening that came from highly individualized, isolated, lonely cultures. If we think about the Welsh awakening. They were they uh, the Welsh awakening happened because of the geographical proximity of all the homes being on top of one or uh, on top of each other. And one of the things about university cities and campuses is that students know how to be together. And it excites me when I think about the Holy Spirit and our university campuses in the UK. Uh, what I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is necessarily going to be replication, but 
you know, we can't organise revivals. The guy called J.K. Morgan said, who preached at Westminster Chapel a number of, for a number of years, he said, you can't organise revival, but we can follow when the wind of God comes and we can only put ourselves up and catch what he is doing. And for me, and for maybe people who are watching, what does that mean for us? Like, uh, you know, what sails do I need to put up in my life to catch what God is doing? And I've been thinking about this. And I think the first thing is, is that I want to be hungry. I, I long for an impartation of the Holy Spirit to experience God in fresh ways. But secondly, I want to be humble. I want to trust God in what he's doing in this moment. And I'm going to be open and surrendered to his move and not in my terms. Um, and so we can start by gathering friends, beginning to seek God in our own way. It doesn't have to be on campuses, but we can start to take responsibility to stir the embers in our own lives, to stoke flames in prayer and worship. And we just need to keep coming back to God and let those flames spread across our communities. Um, I'll leave you with this quote, which I love. Um, Augustine said, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. Mm. And I think that just sums up exactly what has been happening in Asbury. You know, the students have taken responsibility to stir the embers in their own lives, to seek God, to confess their, their faith, to repent and to turn back to him. And God is using their humility and their hunger to, uh, to stir something across that nation and hopefully across the world. I think that's such a key point that you've made there. I think sometimes for us to be able to pour into people, for us to be able to disciple people, like Jesus said, there's his final commission was for us to go and make disciples of all nations. But we need to have that strong basis with God. We need to have that personal connection with him and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And like you say, how do we do that? We need to spend time with God. We need to make sure we make space for him to move in our lives and to come to the word and to read the truth and see how he works within the apostles and within the book of Acts. And I think often, especially as young people, we can look at the Bible and think, well, that was written thousands of years ago. That was written for the people back then. How does that that apply to us today but I want to encourage you that actually we are still the disciples of Jesus we are still the continuation of everything that happened that you read we are the continuation of that and if you just ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into the situations and give you opportunities to speak to others about Jesus then you will but we need to be filled with that first and to have that hunger and humility that Will was talking about so well once we have that hunger and we, we are filled up. The Bible tells us to be salt and light to the earth. So on the university campus, how can we do that? As individuals, how can we reach out to the students around us? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good challenge. I think, um, you know, God desires a generation of Christian students to dare to live in the precious areas of student culture. And I think for us, um, you know, I think about quite a lot, there's quite a lot of different elements of university culture that is a challenge for students, um, where we are challenged uh, on how we are to love wisely and represent the kingdom. I, I, think, I think it's just about making sure that we don't isolate ourselves from those areas of student culture. You know, there are many Christians that avoid social occasions um, uh, on campus uh, in their residential halls because uh, the organised activities of drinking and partying are too much, but that leaves no representation of Jesus in that area of student life. And what I found is in those cultures, um, when, we're, when we stay there, we provide great opportunities to love and serve friends. I'm pretty certain Jesus would have been someone who would have been um, someone who listened to students at 2 a.m., who would have um, given practical help to help people back uh, from a night out. I've got I've actually got a quick story I'd love to share about about uh, exactly this about being salt um in York there was a guy called Will who um he was part of a rugby team and they went out on a night out and they were drinking really heavily and Will um somewhere in that in that night smacked his head and uh, he was severely concussed and rather than the rugby team um taking him to A&E they instead put him in a taxi um, home by himself, which is a little bit dangerous if you ask me. But two housemates who came came out um, to look after him, they woke up and heard him knocking on the door and they cared for him at, at you know, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. They gave him the practical help that he needed. And he, Will woke up in the morning and he asked um, how he could ever repay those two housemates. 
the first one said, yeah, I don't know, buy me a bottle of wine or something, you know, um, nothing too much. But the second housemate said, why don't you come to church with me? And so Will started going along to church with um, this housemate of his who helped him at his, uh, at his dire need. And a few months later, he found home in the local church through the community there. He saw that there was a community of people that was so different to those that he experienced at university. And then a few months later, he found hope in Jesus and he was baptized about a year ago. And for me, like this story just makes me feel so hopeful about how we can be salt and light the earth, that we can be people who still represent Jesus, yet still be in the culture and be a shining light. And I just encourage anybody who's out there, who's doing that, just keep going because stories like Will can happen and we can see, um, you know, the kindness of Jesus. D Jesus didn't come to serve, but to be, you know, you know, came to serve and not to be served. And that is the same way in which we can treat university life. Let's, let's be salt and light of the earth. Let's really um, be representatives of the kingdom. And let's see stories like Will break out across our campuses. Amen. Incredible. And I think that goes to show that we just need to be living in the love of Jesus and acting in the love of Jesus. It's not even necessarily Bible bashing, Bible bashing people on campus and quoting scripture at them all the time or telling them they're doing wrong or even inviting them to church. Sometimes that will come through the opportunities that we have to love and to serve them and to help them in them areas. And it just goes to show with the story you told that they helped Will and then that got his attention to then bring him to church. And he, he was found Jesus, which is absolutely incredible. So thank you for sharing that story. It's, it's amazing. And we've talked a lot, we're coming towards the end of, of the program, and we've talked a lot about decisions of coming to uni, how to make the decision to be there and what to do when we're on campus. But there is just this uh, spoken word that I want to go to that's been given to us by Fusion to show this evening on what do we do with life after uni? How do we make them decisions? And this is called, what am I going to do with my life? It's not that I'm not grateful that you're taking an interest in my life, asking me questions of destiny as we sip coffee in the busy city, coffee that you've paid for with your credit card because you've actually got one. And I know the topic is an obvious one, as I'm sat there chewing on pencil ends and pretty soon the rent money ends and the present story runs out with my pen. But the answer is still, I don't know. It's not that I'm lazy, apathetic, selfish. It's just that with options more vast than the ocean and the glistening career conveyor belt constantly in motion, churning past my eyes, writing five-year plans across the skies, I'm getting lost in the whir and the blur of possibility. It's not empowering to be totally free to be whoever you want to be. Actually, it's paralyzing. It's not that easy to put words to the feeling of knowing you have potential but still standing reeling over the fact that jobs don't come with guarantees. And surely you can't compromise when you've just spent 30 grand on a degree. And is there anything honourable about working in a cafe and just meeting people when you can write essays and analyse data that should mean you get on a career ladder much greater than serving in the local or temping in the nearest call centre that probably won't exist in six months' time when newer technology takes over. So what then? We don't want to disappoint you with your credit cards and stability, but it's frustrating when we've grown up with such a sense of destiny, whilst in the same breath being constantly checked by our harsh economic reality. I'm sorry that the answers don't come easy, both for your anxious looks and for me, so I'll sit here sipping coffee that you paid for with your security and I'll chew on pencil ends making scribbles of my destiny and I'll push on all the doors and I'll try not to be fussy but if I'm not pushing into my sense of calling I'm going to have to wrestle to the ground my own authenticity and I'm trying to embrace the hope that it's okay not to know right away whilst hoping too that breakthrough is on the way maybe it's just around the corner one day in the future that I'm still struggling to carve into a picture, I'll sit opposite you again, 
And as the waiter takes our order, I'll be the one to say, have whatever you want. And maybe for a moment, you'll be paralyzed by the menu's choice. And I'll smile and say, take your time. Knowing that choices can be harder under pressure, but I want you to know that we've got all day and I'll wait for you, whatever. I want you to know that I'm on your side and I empathize with the fact that it's hard to decide. I'll sit with you and hear your stories too and I'll share my own meandering truth, sitting, sipping coffee. And when it comes to the end of the day, I'll pay. And it won't be because all the dreams came true, but because we walked the confusion through. And all the while, I never gave up on you. And you kept walking with me too. As we wrestled to the ground, all the doubts and the fears, as we gave what we had and put in hard work for years. Whilst we believed in having a go at going for hope and hoping that our lives make a difference as we navigate in obedience. And maybe my answers still run out with my pen and I'll be asked again and again, what are you going to do with your life? But then, my answer's really always been the same, since I was never the author of my chapters anyway. So I'll buy the drinks, and I'll sit, and I'll say, I don't know, but it is written. Thank you to Fusion for that really raw but truthful spoken word there that many people can feel once they've left university, once they've graduated, really not sure what life holds for them next, where they should be going, what steps they should be taking. So Will, as an experienced person, you've graduated from university, you've now into a job. What advice can you give those? Maybe they're coming towards the end of their university year or they graduated and they're not really sure where to go, what to do. What advice can you give them? Yeah, I've always um, looked at um, choices in three ways when it comes to big decisions. Um, I've always considered where is the job, where is the location, and where is the community? And I think if you've got two out of three of those spot on that you know that you're um, thriving in, then I think that's the right place for you to be. So for me in Southampton, I knew that Southampton was uh, a place where I loved, you know, the location for Southeast was was wonderful. I was able to travel to the New Forest, down to the coast to do some beach walks. You know, I loved life down in Southampton. I also had an amazing community that I didn't want to leave behind. And actually, they were going to really invest into me if I stayed. And I think that's the thing that we think about with students is we have to move straight straight away after we leave university, which is so not true. Actually, the local church is there for you if you want to make home in it after university. And I think the third thing for me that came up is I had an opportunity to go straight into being a student pastor in the local church. And that just seemed like the right um, formula for me to know that God was wanting me to stay uh, in Southampton to be a student worker and to be supported by that community around me. So I would I would encourage you to have a think about Where's the job that you want? Is it, in the south, is it in the location that you are in already? Or is it somewhere else? But equally, are you leaving a community that actually is going to be good for you? Or actually, are you looking to grow and to move beyond that community? And finally, are you, um, are you, uh, are you in the right location? Is this going to serve the job and the community that you've, that you've got in place? So I think about those three things when I'm thinking about moving forward beyond my degree. That's really good advice. Thank you so much, Will. We have come towards the end of Impact today, but I just want to remind the viewers, if you want to know more about Fusion, you can go onto their website, which is www.fusionmovement.org. They also have a Facebook and Instagram, and their email is on the screen there. So big thank you to Will from Fusion for being with us on Impact tonight and sharing your testimony. I want to encourage you that God is always with you, and he'll give you the strength and the hope you need to be a Christian on campus. God bless you. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.